Uh, I'm Professor Dr. Muhammad Mukhtar, Vice Chancellor of National University Islamabad. It's a really great day for us uh, that uh, we have with us uh, Professor Doctor of Science, Dr. Habil Klaus Ustek. I hope I did good job. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, and for some perhaps even a good evening. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you and uh, yeah, already in the middle of the talk itself that we cannot meet each other in person. We are now in a virtual discussion as so many are taking place today. This COVID-19 crisis has led all of us into a new situation which is in its origins not so new as we might perhaps expect it. But it is challenging in any way we can understand what is going on. Some eight years ago, I was a member of the French think tank uh, Ceros in Paris, and we were sitting together with colleagues from various French universities and were discussing what is going on uh, about the new landscape for universities in the future. We all know there is the situation of distance learning and uh, various forms on how to do it, various ideas and concepts. What we in Paris concluded is that we are facing a very different future of higher education, whether we like it or dislike it, will unfortunately not make much of a difference to us because it will simply happen. The idea which was uh, highly emphasized at this meeting in Paris was that we must say goodbye to much of our known physical structures, that students will not sit any longer in, on their banks and listen to us in person, then the next uh, situation which will be to will which we will have to expect is that a professorship for example as we all know it in form of an uh, employment will cease as well to disappear many academics and this has already started in the last weeks and months in the united states uh, will be service providers that means as a as an academic, you will simply sell your service to various universities, which has, of course, its advantages and disadvantages. The situation will be no more salary, fixed salary, and uh, there will be the uncertainty on both sides, meaning does a university get one of these good experts? Can they pay him? Or is it just, again, the big ones who are in uh, advantage because they have the money to hire the very best uh, which are in the world? But that is what it is. Even earlier, three, three years earlier, I had uh, written a paper which was uh, presented, at, interestingly, uh, in, uh, the Cambr in the University of Cambridge and then again at the ESCP Business School in Paris about the future of higher education in form of an avatar-based university. My very good but uh, deceased friend, Tony Dyson, the name will not tell you much, but just as a side note, he was the creator of Star Wars R2-D2 and later became a very uh, acknowledged researcher in robotics and avatar technology, and especially in learning. The paper at this time as well emphasized that the virtual new world will change our university landscape radically. That is the one side of the situation. Uh, can we go just, just stop please and go back? Thank you. Uh, the situation which we face in this moment is that we are all fixed to what uh, Christensen and uh, the, his other authors have explained in their resources, processes and values theory. 
We have developed our resources, which are academics, which is our physical infrastructure, our IT infrastructures. And these resources are what we can control. We can work with these resources in the way we like it. And based on these resources, we all have, whether in the higher education industry or any other industry, we have developed established processes which we deliver day by day and which we are used to and which make us, due to the routine which we have developed, comfortable. And based on both of them, resources and processes, an organization has created their values. These are the responsible decision-making criteria for explaining what our organization is, who we ourselves are, and in addition, it is as well what a team, a staff is believing in. And as good as this is, it is as always not alone an advantage, it also has its disadvantages. As you can see on the next slide, we are now having the emergent disruption. And there we come to the, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. And here we have a very uh, interesting explanation. Incumbent organizations are very much in favor of sustainable, meaning marginal innovation, because as explained in this, on the slide before, we have the situation of existing resources, processes, and as well values. It is easy to deal with all marginal improvements, whether we have faster uh, infrastructure in IT or whether we have the opportunity to present uh, our lectures in a lecture theater later as a recorded version online. This is easy to do. When we are going into the situation that we are getting a disruptive environment and context, then we have within our established processes and values a real and serious problem because we are not used to, not familiar and often enough not comfortable to deal with something which is extremely different. And that has not only its roots in the last time. Atterbeck, for example, has uh, researched many, many industries from the old icebreakers on the rivers uh, to the days when the refrigerator came and further industries where exactly it is explained like we had the typewriters which failed in the times of the new word processing computer programs or the photography and then the digital photography. That is something where we have a big, big problem. What we face now is one situation which is absolutely difficult for all of us and it is a little bit different. Typically, we have an established industry of which kind ever and then there is somebody who invents a radical innovation. And then this uh, radical innovation starts to make its inroads and changes the face of the industry. This time, it is more the opposite. Uh, COVID-19 has presented us with a situation where there is first the disruption and we are not ready with something to reply to this challenge. We have not yet a real radical innovation which can shape our future. What we know is that in the moment at least, and as it looks for a quite long time, our students will not be able to come back to our lecture theaters. And if they come back, they will not be able to sit together as they could do before. So we have social distancing. And Hawks, who is a very famous future researcher, has very nicely written this, that we are now in the time of a bifurcation, the deep crisis where our world is changing forever. And it is not 
that we are facing an interruption, we are facing a deep disruption. And that is one thing which many, many politicians especially at least uh, say that they don't believe in. But we all see the big, big differences. If you look at the airports or if you look at planes, if you look in, in restaurants, it's all changing, it's all shifting. And that makes the situation very difficult. And that was the starting point of, for our university to consider what do we do. Do we simply uh, make what certainly many had to do, uh, put our lectures and our slides online and uh, leave it to the students to deal with it, to read them many times or uh, give them a short period of time where we are available? Or, or uh, asking us the question, is this really enough? And we came to the conclusion that it will not be enough. It will just help to overcome the present short-term situation, but it will not be enough for the long-term. And this is, if we may have the next slide, please. This is where we are starting to think uh, ab about... No, that was one too much. One back, please. Yep, thank you. We have two ways. We are definitely having a high level of uncertainty because nobody can predict how long COVID-19 will last. We cannot predict whether there will be a second wave, which many are fearing. And we do not know how our students will react to the whole development with reference to the entire context. We have the situation of uh, international students. How many students are traveling the world? The last figure was, I have in mind, over 5 million students worldwide are studying in a different country. But just think about how many of these students were stranded in their country without the opportunity to leave the country because there were no flights. Of course, this influences the next generation of students who are now thinking, if I go to another country, even on another continent, I may be stuck there and I do not know for how long. That is a big, big risk and makes many students very reluctant to consider studies in a different country. So that is something where we have really to consider these crisis signals which are coming. And here we have the two options, which is the alleged strategy that is simply setting us a goal and see how we can achieve this goal. And the situation then is making a very methodolic, methodical action for each of its steps to implement them. But that means that somehow you must have a, a context in which you have not too many variables where you can rely on something. And as we feel at least, is there is not enough on which we can rely. So this situation is more about going with the developments, which is uh, called by Christensen and co-authors the em em emerging or emergent strategy. We need to maintain the flexibility to see Will there be a second COVID uh, wave? Will it not be? Will there be a changed attitude in students' behavior? Or what will happen? And therefore, we must try to have a strategy for our future as a university, which is flexible, which allows us to adapt fast to the new developments, to the new challenges which might emerge or not. And we must carefully listen to the marketplace, meaning our students, our recruitment area, for that we can really learn what do these students adapt to and how will they translate it into the expectations on their studies. 
And for this, we have created an own research group, which consists of researchers from Italy, from Germany. I am part of it. And yesterday I have re uh, received the request from Malaysia, from our good colleagues from University Malaysia Klantan, who want to join as well. And we are very happy about this because we are not the masters of wisdom. The more information we can receive, the better it will be to identify the market signals, to identify the future expectations, and then to go into a new way and develop and discover a new way which might be successful for the future higher education. If we can then have, please, the next slide. The challenging uh, context which exists for us is that, of course, we have what exists. We have what we have, our resources, our processes, our values. And as so many complaints over the many years I have now uh, served in higher education, students talked to me about is the lecturers used to physical studies by PowerPoint. So they are the lecturers as well are very familiar with the situation of presenting their knowledge transfer in form of PowerPoint, which is certainly one way, which is certainly no bad way, but it is different to what will be possible when we have no students in front of us. And then, of course, is the other side of the business, which are the students. The students like our buildings, at least some. They like to go in uh, in some, some seminars. They like to meet with others and work in a group on certain assessments or tasks which we give them. That is what we have. The problem is that as it unfolds in these days, that might not be possible to continue in the future. And then we have, based on this, a triple lock. Let us be honest, since centuries, our delivery of higher education has not changed. When you go centuries back, there were the students, there were the lecturers, the, one, the ones who wanted to learn, the others who gave the opportunity to learn, and they met in a physical building and they were sitting together. The lecturer told, the students listened. Of course, this has been uh, amended, this has been renewed. We have now uh, electronic data, we have PowerPoint and all these things which had not existed before. But all of this is nothing more than a marginal adaptation based on technological advancements. The principal structure has not really changed. And we have, in many countries, regulations which are not fit for purpose. If I take, for example, our new Swiss higher education law, HFKG called, which is uh, coming into effect on the 1st of January 2023, then you have more or less absolutely nothing in it which speaks about distance learning, about transnational studies, about uh, the situation of electronic delivery. It is simply based on this old-fashioned way of delivery. Old-fashioned does not mean that it is a bad way, but a future development is not possible. So there is just in Switzerland, and this is not the only country where it is, so Germany is as well... Uh, very, very similar, Austria as well, where you do not favor a new and different way. And there we come back to the resources, processes and values uh, theory, because that is what they know. That is what they have always understood. And that is what many, especially bureaucrats, refuse to change because it makes them feel uncomfortable. An, uh, an assessor in an accreditation process who is confronted with a new way of, let me say, virtual uh, reality, augmented reality, and even worse, with artificial intelligence, he feels uncomfortable because he doesn't know how this thing works, what it does, will it deliver the knowledge? And there we have this triple lock, which is 
opposing a real radical development into a future higher education landscape. What we as well have and know, everybody who has worked in, uh, in distance learning will certainly have uh, realized that the dropout rates of students are much higher than with physical studies. Have we ever really investigated why it is so? Have we ever tried to understand what is so less engaging in distance learning as it is in physical presence learning, which is not allowing to teach to learn in your own speed? And as well, just uh, the other days, I have received from students the uh, from students from other universities the complaint. The simplistic translation offline to online. Yes, in this present crisis, to deliver at least something, it was important to online present offline teaching content. But that cannot uh, continue forever. And the simplistic translation offline to online simply is not enough. It is not about uh, that we can already, after, our, the sh after the short time of our research, confirm possible to engage and interest students by simply giving them uh, somehow form of online uh, PowerPoint presentations or the old-fashioned way, here you have a distance learning book, here are 150 pages, read through them and be happy. The point is, Kransky at the beginning of the, comp of the online world has differentiated between the digital natives and those who were born before digital came. I am one, and most of us probably in this audience are, people who have started their lives, their professions at times where computers did not play a role. But that has changed. Today, those who are digital natives are not any more just simple digital natives, they are far beyond the situation that they do, did not know and do not know a world without computer. So their expectations are much, much higher than those who were just born and educated in the times of the computer-based systems. So we are now in a very sophisticated environment, which we should not forget that it will influence what the expectations are. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Our conclusion was so far that it is highly unlikely that we simply can change marginally. That would be nice, that would be easy, that would be fast, because we simply adapt a little bit here and a little bit there. We can use what we have, we can work as we used to work. This starts, for example, with assessments and with all the problems when we are having online virtual assessments. That is uh, always with some risks, which we cannot exclude. But the whole context of all sites which we have identified, especially in form of students, in form of the processes which we have and the resources which we have, are simply not allowing it. We will have to widely abandon all what we have, which starts with big buildings and big nice theaters and all these things. Then think a little bit different. Maybe the one or the other of you has already played online games, the multiple player online games. I admit I am playing uh, every day uh, some of the games because as a strategist, I am uh, following the advice of from Japan of the 15th century. If you do not practice strategy every day, it will be like you have never learned it. And interesting is what you can observe and learn in such an online game. You have adults mainly adults in these games, who are engaging, who are doing things together, who are doing teamwork, and who are, of course, some are addicted, but I'm not speaking about it, who are having fun in doing these things online. They are coming online every day, several times as much as their time allows. 
they are interacting, they are exchanging ideas, they are influencing the course of the game. And there is the point where we have uh, influenced by our researcher from Italy and from the National Italian Research Council, Dr. Carlo Fabricatore, uh, added knowledge in serious gaming. It is not about gimmicks, it is not about shooting around, it is about developing an environment and delivery of content in which it becomes important to engage in a game-like process of delivery. And this way, it is not the distance learning in a university, which we at the EHE Eureka have in mind, it is the virtual university which allows to replace the expected existing contexts students have in mind when they decide to study. Of course, one parameter cannot be changed. We must deliver the very same academic quality and scientific work. We must deliver knowledge, which is simply justifying the award of an academic degree. We cannot fall behind the academic standards which we have and which we must deliver because our world will not get easier it will get even more complex and as we probably can all see due to the COVID-19 crisis very much more complicated so may I have the next slide please what we are facing is a radical shift and here we have taken examples from research and seen what has happened. In the early 1990s, when the cheap airlines came up, the budget airlines, which allowed us to, to travel very cheaply, all the established airlines, how they were called, KLM, Air France, Lufthansa, and all, all of Europe, started to think, oh, what these new guys on the block uh, can do, like Ryanair or EasyJet, we can copy easily. We know how the business runs and we uh, are much better than them. We have all the experience, we have all the routine and tradition, we outperform them. Unfortunately, they all failed. The problem was they simply appointed a team and said, now you are playing budget airline. Bring the prices down, deliver what, what uh, is needed, and then we go and we'll, we'll uh, drive all these newcomers from the market. It was the opposite. All the budget airlines of these established airlines went bankrupt. Until one of them is, uh, decided, I kick the whole guys out, the whole bunch of guys out, I give them a big shack at different premises, hundreds of miles or kilometers away, and then they are there together and play. And that was the point when the budget team became successful. So that means here we are back. What we have, what we know, what we value can under such radical shifting forms of new developments be more of disadvantage than of advantage. And that is what we have decided to do as well, because nearly everything has changed. We must replace the existing contexts. Our students will not be able to come to visit us from and study with us from other countries. Then we have to replace the boring and not engaging simplistic content delivery as it is presently often enough delivered I was listening to students telling me of a big German university that uh, they are absolutely appalled by the way how they are now presented with the content. Every professor has a different format. Every professor is uh, delivering via a different channel. It is difficult to find these lectures. And when you eventually find them, they are totally boring, there are some buzzwords, there are some short sentences, uh, and then you have to sit and find these in the books, and uh, they are absolutely appalled by this way. On the other hand, let me please come back to the mobile socializa socialization and interaction of the games. If you present this, 
which is our idea, in form of a serious game, which is team engaging, which is dependent on others, meaning that a student becomes member of a team here and another member of a team there, that they must deliver and fulfill an assessment, for example, in form of a task which only they can achieve together, then the chances of driving are much higher. Again, the question, why do adults engage in yeah, simplistic, sometimes or often enough stupid online games and have fun together, but we in higher education cannot really engage our students to get the same experience. Studies can be fun. It is not about joke fun, it is about serious fun. To really feel the achievement, the mutual achievement, and driving each other to an even better result. And here is where our, one of our main starting points is placed. May I have the next uh, slide, please? So if we consider the bifurcative direction, then we have these effects on students. No physical and regular studies in times of social distancing. Nobody knows how long. The preparedness of studying in a foreign country is definitely reduced. And we risk qualification gaps for students, especially in developing countries, which has effects on society and economy. And the new students will, those starting this year, will not have the same familiarization with our contexts. Of course, the need for our lecturers is to learn about the latest technologies. It will be different to distance themselves from not allowing students, many of the more old-fashioned lecturers, and I know a couple of them, even lovely people, but they are not used to critique from students. See YouTube videos, serious videos, where, where some really good content is uh, presented, and at the end, the authors have a last session in which they simply uh, uh, refer to comments which they have received in form of, I have claimed in my, uh, in my video number eight that this and this is the case. I have received the content, the, uh, the, the comment that I am wrong, that in reality it is this way and that way. And I must admit this is correct or here we have a way how this can be done as well. This we must start to ad adapt. And this way, augmented reality, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence will replace these PowerPoint. We definitely have to forget about PowerPoints online. Next slide, please. So we are approaching these technology-based solutions which start with enrollment accompanying accompanying a student from enrollment to graduation with all the modules with all the teaching with the different forms which are made possible by high end technology there are now assessment there is now available assessment uh, software which allows controlled assessments in a certain time Avoiding, avoiding to the same extent, in my understanding, uh, academic misconduct as we could also do it physically. We need to replace our bricks and mortar structures by new, exciting online environments, which are engaging and not just simply here is your here is your starting page. Here you can go to your own folders. Off you go, and that's it. And we must involve students globally. We must involve them as individuals. And when we can form interdependent multicultural student teams who must, who are forced to work together to achieve something, then we have an engaging environment and new context. And it is as well the direct lecturer-student influence, 
not anymore, I know, you learn. It is about, we both learn, we both share our knowledge. I will, as a lecturer, have some more knowledge, which I will transfer to you, but I'm open to discuss it with you in a way which was not so much in a lecture theater where you have 300 students in front of you. So, and therefore we have decided to start a complete new and separate university in a different country. And as I spoke about, we need a context where the regulatory and legal framework is more promising and more advantage. And that was a big, big challenge for us. Switzerland was definitely no option because we are bound to what Switzerland expects, which is the second best higher education system in the world as it is ranked. Yes, absolute outstanding knowledge is in Switzerland, but it is based on what exists and very little interfaces for future orientation. And the official accreditation processes are in the moment not fit for purpose. We are bound and fixed into, you must have so and so many uh, full-time professors, you must have so and so many lecture rooms, you must have so and so many computer places. What do I do with 30, 50, 100 computer places when I have a lockdown? That's, that's not possible. And we do not know how long we will have. And this means a new world is emerging after this disruptive impact and we must change. And those controlling us must change and well, as well. And therefore, radically innovative approaches will outperform the marginal adaptation once again, which gives us who are not the Harvard, Yale or Oxford universities or Sorbonne in Paris, a chance, a real chance, because they are much more bound to their resources, processes and values than we are. And we do not want to be the organization which is asking themselves what has happened to them or just sitting there and observe and try to find a point where it might be correct and justified to change. We want those to be anticipating what comes. We want to, uh, to listen to the students. We want to learn from the students. And we have two researchers which do nothing else than checking with students what they want and then try to make sense of, out of these things and try to find ways to translate these wants and expectations of students into the future delivery of our modules. Because as said, the quality, the academic and scientific quality cannot be less. And this leaves us to the uh, this uh, leads us to the next slide, which is where we are having implemented this step by step process, which is making projections. Our research team tries to make a projection. This is what our present in observation leads us to. We cannot be sure that it will really be this way, but we continue to observe. And then on, ba on the basis of these assumptions, we try to identify, is it really true that it will be this way or are there other ways which we must consider as well? So we must evaluate as well as what we have as data but as well, what is coming out? Because this crisis is ongoing. We do not know what comes next. We do not know if, hopefully not, a second wave comes. And then we implement a plan to learn, to test whether the critical assumptions which we have made are reasonable through this entire research in form of technology, in form of possibilities through regulations, because we are not on our own. We must fulfill our legal uh, compliance as everybody else. And when we are getting to a point where we can be rather serious and can be certain that it is the way, then we implement 
this strategy. And for this we have, and I'm very honest with you, we have even as a private university reserved a complete cohort of free studies. We will offer students the opportunity to completely study their degree free of cost in exchange for helping us to see how they feel about our ways, our suggestions, what they would like to change and how they would like to change. Because we cannot be sure what really will happen in one, two or three years. All we can be rather sure is that it will be a very different world to that we have left in January to March 2020. And therefore, with a reference to the last slide of my presentation today, it is about the question, can we change marginal, which would be ideal and comfortable, which would just be so easy, or must we change radically? Must we accept high level of uncertainty ourselves? Must we make many breaches of our ways, how we have delivered and how we have worked all these many years? And we believe, yes, if we want to deliver high performance in the future, then radical is the expected way. As much as we would like to have it simple and just adaptation, we do not believe in this future of marginal and simple adaptation. What I am, have presented now to you as my final concluding sentence is, it is not the, the, the wisdom of, of uh, the wisdom, it is simply our belief, what we feel and how we think that the future will be different. There will be many other opportunities and many other ways, and we are the first ones being interested to learn about them. So thank you very much for this time which you have given to me. I hope it was a little bit of interest to you, and I'm now very happy to ask uh, to answer questions you might have. Uh, bro, this is quite interesting. I hope all my colleagues, they enjoyed your talk and particularly what Switzerland is doing in this uh, COVID-19 era. So what I will do, I will request uh, our coordinator of this Global Academic Leader Academy, Murtza Nu, to say a few words. And then I have uh, several of my vice chancellor colleagues, uh, as well as uh, the people like uh, who has been heading the entire higher education system of a province or the country, they will be definitely asking you some questions. Murza, you want to say some words? I'm, I'm very happy to, to answer all the questions. Go ahead, Murza. Unmute yourself. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, first of all, I am, first of all, I am thankful to the Honorable Professor for sparing his precious time and very, very valuable and insightful lecture. And it was a very, you can say, based upon the best international practices. And on the behalf of the GALA and the Inter-University Consortium and the National Scale University as well, I am thankful to you, sir, for a very, very, uh, you know, uh, it's a very, it was a very, very productive session. Although I have joined late due to the technical problems, connectivity issues are always there. So thank you very much, sir, once again. And now it's over to the Professor Dr. Mukhtar, sir. And uh, for effect, uh, I would also appreciate him uh, as well for effectively conducting the session uh, and uh, taking this initiative forward to the other parts of the country.